Uh, I'm super excited to be here with my friend uh, Luigi Bernasconi. Uh, we're in Lugano, Switzerland at an amazing, beautiful studio at uh, Grotto Valletta, our favorite restaurant in Lugano, Switzerland. Uh, we've been here for many occasions from you know, Vans launch parties, movie premieres to family outings. If you're ever in Lugano, Switzerland, come to Grotto Valletta. Luigi, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Appreciate it. And as you know, uh, this is a fairly new podcast, but getting more comfortable and more of an expert as we go through these shows. So I will be DJing on the side, flipping cameras back and forth. Go excited for to be doing this. Um, so Luigi, um, excited to have you on, as I mentioned. Um, but what I'm really excited about is to talk about product merchandising and merchandising as a whole. And I believe that many people don't necessarily know what product merchandising really actually is, and there's multi-functions of it. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all sort of category or occupation. But before we get into that, I touched a little bit about uh, Luigi's background, and I'm a fan of him. I'm really uh, impressed with the brands that he's worked for. We both share a product merchandising background, but a brand like Bottega Veneta, uh, Prada, Burberry, Acme Studios, and his own company, amazing uh, consultancy called Scythia, uh, within merchandising, we'll get into, excited about. So really uh, shining a light on product merchandising, but also shining a light on fashion and luxury merchandising. It's a bit unique and maybe a little bit different than some of the traditional merchandising from marketplace that you see when you go into a mall um, or into your favorite retailer. Um, you might see some of the brands that uh, Luigi's you know, been a part of, but uh, it might be a difference. Let's get into that a bit. Any questions, Luigi, so far? All good on my side. All good on your side. I like that. Well, the pleasure is all on the side of the table. Believe me. <laughs> Sorry, it's an office-based quote. I like to do that. Okay, so question number one. Um, what was your pathway to product merchandising? How did, you, how did you get into it? By chance. So I studied history okay. in Paris at uh, Sorbonne. Okay. But I always wanted to, uh, to get into fashion. Cool. So after my, uh, my university, my bachelor degree, I, I applied for an amazing school called uh, EFM, okay. Institut Français de la Mode uh, in Paris. Nice which was financed by uh, Saint Laurent um, Protégé. And um, that uh, basically um, allowed me to kind of uh, create like uh, a background and uh, learn, uh, let's say, the basics of uh, the fashion management. Sure. Uh, it was a really complete uh, school. It was one year and a half. And uh, since uh, my background wasn't the traditional background, uh, of uh, all the, uh, let's say, fashion students. Um, basically, it was really difficult for me after that year to get an internship because brands that were getting interned, they were looking for like people with uh, economics background sure. with a master degree in, uh, in fashion management. I had history, uh, so modern history wasn't really the, the, the regular pathway. Right. Uh, but I got really lucky because a friend of mine uh, that had that uh, traditional uh, background mm -hmm. uh, got an internship at uh, Yves Saint Laurent. And, uh, but uh, he actually really wanted to get into the jewelry industry. Um, so he was even luckier to get a second uh, internship at Van Cleef. Okay. Uh, so he decided uh, to uh, recommend me to take his first uh, internship at uh, Yves Saint Laurent in the European buying department. So here I am uh, in, uh, as a first internship in Yves Saint Laurent, part of the caring group, an amazing uh, luxury house. And uh, as we know, uh, luxury is a really kind of close circle. It's really difficult to get in. And when you are in, then, I mean... If you behave, uh, you tend to remain in. Okay. But it's true that uh, even when um, luxury brand recruit, um, it's really selective in the sense of uh, which names do you have on your CV? Do you have any names which are part of this inner circle or not? Sure. And the first selection is done usually like that. So. That's uh, how I started, and I didn't really 
knew at the time uh, what was merchandising, uh, and um, actually the, the the job description was uh, buying for sure. the European uh, DOS uh, directly operated store network. So I was obviously an assistant on all product categories, doing basically analytical work and whatever everybody else didn't want to do. But exposure to different parts of a merchandising role. So it's great to be on the ground floor to have an understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. So I really learned a lot because my boss, my first boss at the time, uh, she was called Patrizia Ciccarelli, and uh, she really threw me in the water. Uh, she really knew clearly what she wanted. Uh, she never told me how to get there, so it was really for me to figure it out. And uh, it was a great experience because obviously if you want to prove yourself, you find a way, you work hard, and uh, you discover the natural path, the easier path to, um, to the solution. So that was fantastic. Um, so that was step one, uh, buying, which can be called retail merchandising. We can get into that uh, later on. So buying, uh, if you want to touch briefly on it, is uh, about uh, doing the product selection uh, for a specific network of stores, uh, knowing which are the specificities of uh, that market. In that specific case, it was the European market, so um, the, key, um, the key fashion cities like Paris, Milan, uh, but also beyond uh, only those cities, wherever the, the brand had a store. Um, and uh, doing a selection based on um, local specificities, uh, budget of each store, a proportion of each categories, shoes, bags, ready to wear, and so on and so forth. And largely called an open to buy, correct? Yes, exactly. In function of uh, that open to buy, right. you will pick uh, from an assortment of, let's say, 100 product, and you select, let's say, 60 that correspond better for that specific market. Right. And the, the open to buy is, is the key. It, it holds the keys to how much you can buy and helps manage the capacity of what you can buy, can buy it in. And you worked, that was a vertical retailer because you worked for the brand, correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, okay. And question for you from your buying experience background. I know you bought for the European marketplace, Yeah. but was it sort of a one size fits all or, or were each store treated uniquely different as far as an assortment standpoint? So um, usually you have a master order, so it's like a common selection because usually luxury brands want to have like a top-down vision that uh, goes in every store. And then they allow, let's say, a percentage, which is like the tailored part right. of, um, of the assortment. Okay. So consistency is super important, especially when you're you know, representing any brand. But when you walk into a, 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 a brand store or a showcase store, there's consistency for the product messages and the... The, the right products to be uh, shown the right way. Absolutely. Yes, consistency is key in luxury because uh, uh, luxury really want to protect uh, uh, the story uh, that they want to uh, kind of deliver to the final customer. So sure. absolutely one of the most important thing is consistency. However, things evolved uh, because uh, markets um, evolved in different uh, way. Mm -hmm. um, consumer consume progress in different way and uh, brands had to adapt, obviously. So what, what categories were you buying? Were you buying all categories, a specific category? Can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I started as an intern for all product categories, uh, but then step two, uh, three, and four, I, um, I entered the world of menswear. Um, after Saint Laurent, I moved to Prada. Uh, which was an amazing school, and um, I was in charge of uh, um, the retail merchandising for the European market, again, uh, which had a different uh, configuration because it included also the Russian market, um, but uh, it was only for the men's ready-to-wear category. Okay, understood, understood. That's fascinating. It, it, it's, it's fascinating for me because I had a very similar background, not in fashion or luxury. I came from more of an action sports background where I was started, you know, managing retail stores, but I got into buying uh, shortly after that. Where I was buying skateboards, snowboards, um, outdoor equipment, cycling equipment, uh, bikes, things like that. So I'm really interested in maybe as we talk through this, is connecting the dots. What is similar and what is very just different? So I might share some of my experience alongside yours. 
is part of the interesting path of the our two paths. Uh, next question: um, What has been one of the one or, one or two of your favorite product lines that you've worked on in any brand? Honestly, it's really difficult to answer because um, I had amazing experience in all brands I work, uh, work for. All experiences have been amazing, but really different. Um, I have to say, um, continuing with Prada, I learned uh, really the art of uh, retail merchandising there because they are really, really careful about um, the relationship with the, um, with the stores and uh, visual merchandising. So it's, um, it's definitely one of uh, the best experience I had, but uh, I can't say that uh, the other brands I work for weren't at the same level. I really learned different things in different brands. Um, I have to say Prada is probably the brand with the strongest um, identity. Um, when you see a Prada look, you immediately, at least if you are in fashion, identify um, uh, who it is, who is it from, uh, and also on the inside of the company, the belonging to the company uh, is incredible. I right. have uh, friends that I met back then that are still working there because they are so attached to the brand, the creativity, the talent of uh, Miss Prada uh, that they decided to remain. So the product attachment in Prada is probably the strongest. Then, uh, yeah, all the other experience were amazing too. That's great to hear that you can work for some some place that you're you're passionate about. It it meets the needs of your own lifestyle um, and what it is you like to do. So it's rewarding. It, it's almost like be careful because you take some of that work home because you love it so much. But in a sense, um, you know, you're providing value and, and a luxury experience for the consumer, um, which is very very cool. So one question I'd like to ask uh, beyond that is. When we get into all the different types of merchandising, how do you see merchandising today evolving? Merchandising is evolving uh, constantly um, because um, it's, um, it's not something that is set in stone. It evolves as fashion evolves, obviously, because um, one of the key aspects of a good merchandiser is really to adapt uh, to uh, the creatives. So in function of how the creativity of a brand uh, or um, an industry evolves, uh, and merchandising needs to evolve too. But uh, if you want to be a little bit more concrete, um, when I started, and it was really the beginning of uh, fashion merchandising as we know it today, um, the, um, the job was really about looking backwards, looking at the numbers, the figures, the analytics, and trying try to protect what worked well and leave uh, little space to creativi creativity. While now I see, at least in, uh, in luxury um, fashion, uh, mm -hmm. merchandiser are more there to kind of enhance the creativity that comes from the designer and trying to build a strategy around that rather than force a strategy that comes from the number. So it's a really different, almost opposite perspective. That brings up a really good point. So, you know, what does the role that product merchandising plays? And we touched on that a little bit, um, but it's really, it's very strategic. But one thing I don't want to leave out, which you mentioned is mm. the creativity aspect of merchandising. Yes, you're working with amazingly talented designers, product developers, marketers, but it's up to the, the merchandisers to take a lead in the strategic part of the business. It, and the front end, uh, the process of the brief, after the brief, and making sure that the sell-through is, is positive. And it's a positive experience for the consumer. So I think that aligning the creativity portion of merchandising and aligning that with the creativity of design you know, and product marketing is very, very important. From a cross-functional standpoint, it's a team. It's a team, and there needs to be consistencies in that. And you brought up a really good point in, in terms of all these different functions within, within the, um, obviously, a company is the points of view, right? Not every mm. leader within a function is going to have mm. the same point of view as the merchandiser. So it's great for the merchandise to collect all of that to make an informed decision on the product line. So, you know, with all that being said, you know, you've got product merchandising functions and phases, right? And I'll touch on a couple of them. You know, you've got... Typically, depending on the brand that you work for, in my experience, is a great brand starts with a creative vision, right? A creative vision with distinction, right? 
And what comes after that shortly is product briefs. The merchandising team will have to create a product brief that gets delivered to the product development team, the product design team, and to the product marketing team. Um, there's also assortment planning, there's product roadmaps, there's collection merchandising, seasonal flow, product life cycle, which is very, very important. Um, and then also the foundational evergreen products in any industry. And typically those are the foundational products that leave the lights on. So in your experience, go to market, how important is that? What role does that play in luxury merchandising? Yes, really interesting question. Um, let me go back um, just a couple of um, seconds because you mentioned something really interesting, meaning the differences in terms of perspective. So if we talk about collection merchandising, so the upstream part of merchandising is really about that. So merchandising is about translating market needs or business needs to uh, a team that doesn't really speak the same language, doesn't speak number, doesn't speak money language, speaks creativity, speaks um, inspiration. So it's really a different language. So it's really important to kind of have the legitimacy to kind of uh, speak both, translate the needs, create feedback loops in order to kind of make sure that uh, the true needs of the market are delivered in the way that designers and creatives understand. Uh, um, so in a way, a merchandiser is a translator. In a way, a merchandiser is a bridge builder between uh, left and right brain. So um, that's definitely um, one of the key aspects of, um, of our job. Um, then when it comes to um, the downstream uh, part of merchandising, uh, which can be associated with retail merchandising, is definitely uh, to kind of take that um, vision coming from um, the designers um, and that strategy that has been defined from um, the collection merchandiser and make sure that through the buy, uh, this uh, will be then... Uh, uh, received uh, unfiltered uh, or at the least filtered um, from the customers. So that's definitely really important because luxury, in my opinion, um, if you want to pinpoint the differences between uh, like um, sportswear or um, other um, type of uh, apparel, um, is definitely more a push model rather than a pool model. So it's more creating a desire rather than answering to a true desire, a true need. So luxury, we can't say that uh, is kind of fulfilling uh, uh, a vital need. Um, so uh, that's one of the main differences. I love what you said about you know, merchandising, you're the translator, and you distilled it very, very well. And I won't repeat that. So thank you for articulating that. Because it's it's for anyone that isn't merchandising, they can they can relate to that. But I think it's also a little bit of a lesson and awareness for you know how broad you can open your lens as being a translator within the business, the marketplace, the needs of the consumer. I uh, really like what you said about luxury brands, the differentiation mm -hmm. there. You know, they don't fulfill a true need; they create a desire, right? And they don't fulfill a desire that is already there, which I like from our last conversation we had. A push, model, a push model, not a pull model. So, you know, I had an amazing experience at one of the brands I used to work for in Rome recently. Um, we were at the Bottega Veneta, mm. and uh, at the moment we walked in, it, it was a different experience than I've been in walking to any other, you know, luxury store. You know, yes, you have the security guard greeting you and maybe loosely following you, but it was a very, very nice experience mm. um, from all of the collectible furniture from all over the world to making us feel warm and welcome and not feeling like out of our league, why are you here? If you understand yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it was, a, it was almost like walking into a bit of a museum, but a museum where you could buy things and have access to touch, to feel, to talk about. So in, in your experience at Bottega Veneta, could you elaborate on the, what I experienced a little bit in Rome? Yes, so luxury brands, and uh, Bottega Veneta is definitely uh, one of the, the most prominent uh, representative of that segment, um, want to create that environment, that experience. 
and um, it's not a buzzword to create an experience. Uh, it has always been the case. So in the past, the experience was getting a glass of champagne and sitting in a really nice, comfortable couch while uh, the sales assistant was providing you with the, the products you requested. Um, it's, it's an experience that um, has been uh, curated uh, on all aspects. So it's really uh, the, the sum of the attention to detail, uh, from the furniture to the comfort to the service uh, to the selection of the staff. Uh, uh, nothing has been left uh, um, alone. And uh, in that sense, yes, the goal is really to kind of, yes, make you feel that you are spending like a huge amount of money for for a product that uh, is actually a function that you can find 10 times cheaper elsewhere. But if you are getting that service in a way, it's just like a confirmation that you experience that, um, that experience. That's great to hear from your perspective because you worked for a brand, uh, Bottega Veneta and other brands like that. So I, I appreciate that I didn't feel pressured to buy something. Again, I feel like I was walking to a beautiful art gallery and I was warmly welcomed. So that, that stood out for me. We did end up buying something <laughs> and that will be in the family forever. Um, but I thought it was an amazing experience and just hearing it from you is, is, enriches it a bit. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit mm. about uh, trends, mm -hmm. fashion influence, mm -hmm. where they stem from, what we're kind of seeing today. Um, as, as we all know, trends are cyclical, right? And a lot of it comes from nostalgia or even having that one-of-a-kind item. But I think for someone that is truly stylish, from my perspective, is someone that creates their own style. Maybe they're putting pieces together in their own way. Maybe some of it's thrifted, maybe some of it's new. But there are some, maybe some consistencies out there. But what I, what I believe has been a trend for a long, long time that's made itself into fashion is outdoor. You know, you're seeing outdoor brands on the runway. You're seeing, you know, the high fashion luxury brands getting influenced from skateboarding, and that's been around for, for a while as well. So can you give us a peek inside of that a little bit um, from the inside of these types of brands where youth culture, skateboarding, or outdoor has been an influence for luxury brands? Absolutely. So um, I think that now there is like a big cross-pollination. So, and uh, it's something that we've seen over the last uh, 20 years and it's increasing obviously thanks to uh, social media. So it's not pure anymore. We have like hybrids and uh, we can't really define a style anymore. Um, and in my opinion, when it comes to fashion, it's much more difficult to uh, distinguish tribes that when we were younger, either you were this, either you were that, either you were a skateboarder, either you were a rapper, either you were something else. And each of those had a really specific style. Now, and I really like that, the new generation, they don't fear to kind of borrow uh, pieces and uh, mix and match high and low, left and right. So I think that's super cool. And um, this cross-pollination of cultural influences um, that uh, germinated uh, in the street got uh, obviously um, also took uh, for, from the, the, the fashion, uh, the, the, the high fashion brands. And that's why that in the runway you, say, you see influences of it. And I just read an article about uh, the 50th birthday of uh, hip hop and how hip hop influenced uh, fashion and how at the beginning it was really kind of uh, uh, a style of for the outcast it never got uh, let's say absorbed by um, traditional fashion houses because obviously they wanted to pr protect that je ne sais quoi of uh, uh, richness or chic uh, while yeah. uh, over the last years as you said uh, the cross-pollination of uh, what uh, was happening in the streets arrived on the runway and that's mm -hmm. uh, that's super cool that's awesome I'm writing notes and I, I do that if you listen to my podcast I do that a lot so if you hear a pause it's me writing um, so I wanted to discuss a few more trends that go along with that so you've got sport You've got seasonal shifts like buy now, wear now, vintage, vintage retro, leisure, nostalgia, high-low, normcore, 
uh, genderless, timeless, and fit. I think fit, from my perspective, can also inform a fashion or a trend. You know, whether it's skinny, slim, baggy, loose. Um, any ideas on that and how maybe fit and how you wear things could inform just a trend in, in the marketplace? I think trends are cyclical and uh, fashion is cyclical because just uh, you get fed up or bored with what you see in the mainstream. So if you are like uh, somebody that likes to have a specific identity and distinguish uh, himself from the masses, obviously you generate uh, uh, the, the beginning of that new trend in a way because you are that kind of uh, fashion forward uh, reference and when you got fed up about skinny jeans and you re-embrace for the X time uh, wider fits obviously you kick start a new movement that then become mainstream and then obviously people uh, that are looking ahead then they're gonna willing to kind of go back to skinny jeans for example and you know it's a never ending cycle which is funny but uh, I think it's good for business because obviously, again, you create a desire and you sell more. Not sure if it's great, but um, what's good is that if you kind of kept your skinny jeans in your closet, you can just bring them back and uh, you don't need to buy new ones. Exactly. Is that a form of sustainability? Hold on to what you think is out of style. Pack it away instead of buying new ones and they come out again, potentially. So I remember when you know, slim was the big deal. Then it was skinny, and then how skinny can you get them? And I, I mean, lately, over the past couple of years, it's been how, how baggy or how much looser can you get? Um, but I like that there's options. You know, people are out there, you know, creating their own styles, but maybe imposing new trends, which is kind of cool. Um, there's one trend in particular. Let's not call it a trend. This is called mm -hmm. a style. I took a trip to uh, Modena, Italy with my family. I, I mentioned to you before, and... As soon as we drove in there, mm. I saw the most stylish, stylishly effortlessly, effortlessly styled older older men. When I say older men, I'm talking about 70s, maybe even 80s, but maybe late 60s to 70s. I mean, just super stylish like from a timeless, from a steezy standpoint to their uh, you know vintage bike, head to toe. It, it was nothing like I've ever seen. Is that something that maybe in your experience uh, is unique to parts of Italy or Europe or maybe just Modena? In my opinion, uh, when it comes to men's elegance, Italy has something, uh, is something, is, is always ahead or, or it's just better at maintaining what uh, we all think elegance is because obviously it's quite difficult to define mm -hmm. what it is but uh, what uh, we have in our mind as men um, and what we define as elegance is probably the best represented uh, in Italy and uh, this is despite the trends this goes beyond what we just mentioned this is something that is there to stay and it doesn't mean that you can't just have a nice pair of uh, adidas gazelle with your double-breasted suit but it's just how you combine and it's also about fit i i wouldn't say that it's about modena obviously in uh, sure, a lot of, of region you, you have obviously napolitan tailors that that are amazing and obviously that spreads into like a regional um, sensibility about what uh, great tailoring is um, you you obviously have like uh, milan in a totally different way which um, has a uh, own elegance so i think in italy yes so th there is for men's wear for sure in my humble opinion mm -hmm. uh, they are a step ahead in terms of uh, elegance I like that elegance because the elegance that I've experienced uh, here living in Switzerland and having access to Italy is, is the elegance. But the elegance I see is effortless. It's not something that you're, you're forcing into a, a box, a trend. It's something that is just effortless. And maybe these men have dressed like this for a long, long time. And maybe mm -hmm. they're just, you know, subtly adapting their style, um, whether it's the day or the year. But uh, I was really impressed with the beard, the hat, the bike, the, the, the whole kit. Um, so anyways, I thought I'd drop a line and just show some respect from that, from that perspective. Uh, very cool. So I'm going to move this along uh, a little bit further. So there's something within product merchandising and, you know, the functions that work in and around it is 
are timelines. Um, and one of that, one of the things we've been talking about for years now is speed to market, right? So there's speed to market that is, for some brands, chasing trends or reacting and trying to create new trends quickly. Um, from your pers- experience, like, wh- where do you see speed to market happening? Is, is it fast fashion or is it really trying to get ahead and keep the customer engaged uh, quicker for more sell through? Yes, for sure. I think that uh, with social media now, um, the pace of delivering novelty uh, has increased in order to kind of answer to the demand. And demand is generated by the fact that the more exposition a trend has, the quicker you move on to the next one, as we said before. But um, yes, that's a super interesting question because it's really a big part of merchandising to kind of plan ahead the delivery and the life cycle of um, each product's collection, lines, capsules, and so on. So if we go back 10 years, obviously the, um, the regular pace was uh, two slash four collection a year, so spring, summer, and uh, fall, winter. And um, it was really weird because um, it wasn't dictated by a true need. So it wasn't uh, providing a product when the customer really needed for some reason. And that was also dictated by the fact uh, um, that uh, uh, the, the development calendar was based on the calendar of the fashion shows. Basically, you had a collection six months in advance. Uh, versus when uh, you could actually wear that piece, meaning that you will get some uh, fur and heavy jumpers uh, in full summer and vice versa with light pieces in uh, in winter. While now um, merchandising evolved uh, in a way that uh, could uh, deliver the product when the customer actually needed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what we call buy now, wear now, meaning that we deliver the products when the customer buy it and wear it and I would push it one step ahead, post a picture on social media with the product he just bought, and then he move on. So um, that's uh, um, the evolution. Then um, what's really important is to, um, to differentiate the lanes, meaning that you could still maintain today this regular flow where the majority of your core collection is delivered following a calendar, which is... Uh, um, Twice a season, twice a year, so fall, winter, and uh, spring, summer. However, in addition to that, you have different lanes, which can be faster uh, or slower, slower, in order one to kind of um, allow production capacity to be more regular. Because if you think about two big collection a year, it means that the the factories have two massive peaks a year, and then they don't produce anything else uh, during the year. While uh, uh, doing multi lanes development calendars allow you to kind of have uh, uh, release a little bit of the pressure that the production has and also deliver product in different moments uh, which have different life cycle. This uh, goes hand in hand though with uh, markdown calendars because obviously um, luxury has a massive advantage versus um, like uh, the lower tiers of the apparel because they usually don't do markdown or they do less markdown. And if your life cycle is dictated by the markdown, obviously you have a limited lifespan before it gets uh, the product gets marked down. While if you don't care about that, you can deliver a product one week before markdown because you know you're not going to get it marked down. So... Um, that's something really interesting. So just in short, uh, you can maintain your traditional calendar, but adding other lanes with a different pace in order to kind of uh, fill uh, um, the market needs and answer answer to customer demands. That makes a lot of sense. And I think establishing those lanes up front as as part of the model is, is really important, as opposed to trying to be reactionary and trying to put new product out there all the time. Um, so back to the buy now, wear now, you know, that, that's super important, but I think it's a challenge for merchandising, um, to get ahead of that as seasons are changing different climates, right? So when you would, if you were in Southern California, I remember this a few years back, it was, we were sweating bullets outside and, you know, the board shorts <laughs> were on sale and the flannels were, were full price right in front of you. Cause that was the traditional seasonality. But that, that can't happen anymore. That's, that's, that's almost backwards. So I think evolving that model and understanding that the seasonality is very important 
and not just in one location in Southern California, that's across the regions that you're responsible for in the world, because there's reverse seasonality as well. So I think uh, it's going to be an, uh, an important uh, research um, for all of us that are in this business to nail that seasonality and to also be adaptable to how the world is changing, just climate change. Any perspective on that from your side? Yes, absolutely. I think it's um, really important when you operate globally to, to know your market really well and uh, have that feedback loop uh, that inform uh, uh, merchandiser first and then designer in order to develop cal collection that answer um, all needs. And uh, those, uh, the products and the weights of your products uh, in function of, as you said, the seasonality of or the country of the world where the customer lives. So um, that makes the brief of the collection really complex because it needs to take into consideration the deliveries, so the drops, um, the different local specificities, uh, climates, um, delivery um, times and um, all that uh, included in one brief to design in the most clear way. So um, that's make our job passionating, uh, but it's definitely complex to, to keep depth in, in one brief. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it was a good topic to, to touch on because I know that anyone that is in merchandising that is a constant challenge, whether you, you realize it um, or not. Um, another hot topic to, to bring up is sustainability. And we mm -hmm. can do a whole segment on that separately, but we won't get into that too much. Um, but from a sustain sustainability standpoint, from, from your lens on the, on the luxury style, are there any efforts um, that are taking place that you know of or, or opportunities on the luxury side of the business on behalf of sustainability? Massive opportunity. I think that uh, sustainability should be a given, should be a way of working, should be embedded in all the procedures that uh, at least luxury brands uh, have. And um, especially considering the price points and the marginality, I think is something that can be included in the cost. Uh, I'm saying in the cost because unfortunately, as of today, finding sustainable alternatives in terms of raw material or production procedures is usually more exp uh, expensive. Um, as more adoption, as less uh, this is impacting on the cost, thankfully. But in terms of opportunities, uh, definitely raw materials. There are a lot of uh, um, developments in, in that sense. You have even top luxury brands like uh, Hermes uh, creating uh, lines um, in uh, alternative uh, materials than leather. Um, or uh, having like recycled polyester for uh, brands like uh, Prada. Um, then what, what's really important, I think, more than the actual uh, raw materials or procedure is to be transparent about uh, what has been done. I think the customer is more and more careful about that. I think it's more important to be authentic than sustainable. So to be authentic, meaning trustworthy when it comes to procedures. So at least you know what you buy um, and you decide in function of uh, what's on the, uh, on the menu. And uh, this is valid uh, uh, also for food. So, for example, I do uh, my, my grocery shopping these days uh, looking much more than five or ten years ago at uh, the ingredients list. And uh, there are apps that actually give you a score um, and uh, allow you to take uh, informat, uh, informative um, Decision. decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, that's, that should be the case uh, also for fashion, um, as, as, as I said, especially given the price tag. Now, I like that perspective, and I like what you said about, you know, sustainability is, for some is almost a buzzword in a sense. It's really about authenticity and transparency. Mm. So informing the consumer what they're buying and maybe use as an opportunity to, to share the types of efforts or improvements they are to make it even more sustainable or responsible. Um, I think that that's a responsibility that anybody or any brand that's making anything to, to look inward on. Um, you know, it's, we're also creating you know, uh, you know, product lines each season, each year. We talked about speed to market in those lanes, but maybe even being more strategic about that. You know, uh, for some brands, it's an 18-month product cycle, right? Um, but 
for some brands it's not. So what can we do to, to basically make it last on the shelf and be enticing the consumer longer while having these lanes to supplement style or freshness or seasonality, buy now, wear now? I think that's an opportunity um, you know, as an advocate towards sustainability to, to think about from a merchandising standpoint, a best practice, so to speak. So I guess I urge all of us that are creating product briefs and to aligning with your you know, cross-functional teams is how can we look at sustainability differently, right? And I, I think, yes, we want to protect the earth. We want to make more responsible decisions. Yes, we want to partner maybe with the factories and leverage any gray edge or unused um, you know, raw materials and turn that into something we can use as opposed to more waste. Um, so those are just, that's just my rant and my thoughts about it. Uh, I think there's just still a lot of opportunity in the world. Yes, that's uh, definitely one of the key aspects I'm taking care of with my consulting agency, Saltia. So if we think that uh, um, every brand as of today uh, develop collection that they are, that are wider than what the mass, mass uh, the, the the market needs, and that the open to buy, meaning the budget that the buyers have uh, to purchase their collection to put in their store, is usually allowing like 30 to 40 percent. Uh, uh, sell through percentage of collection that is already dedicated to either markdown or waste, mm -hmm. meaning that you buy 60 uh, to sell and 40 just in case. It means that there is a massive waste and this is a big part of a merchandiser job or my job as a consultant right now is how to optimize first collection development in a way that you just develop what actually answer market needs and obviously the creativity needs and also that the open to buy is much more closer to the reality of what the potential of what you can sell as a store meaning that using analytics in order to kind of perfect your buy to kind of reduce that part of uh, sell through that is usually already allocated to waste correct and i think maybe one example is say um, you're a buyer for or merchandiser for pants right and maybe you need to you know try to figure out how to allocate this buy for the season, right? So it's really focusing on the core sizes, so the best-selling sizes, not to alienate any other sizes, but yeah. as instead of just buying it all equally and evenly across sizes, maybe we just focus more on those core sizes and learn you know, through analytics and what we need to maybe trend up and trend down and mm -hmm. as opposed to just making stuff that's gonna go on sale anyway. Um, I might be kind of bullish. I don't wanna exclude anyone that's in a, a certain size, but. Uh, I think it's important to just be very responsible and how much extra we're putting into the marketplace. And I don't remember the, uh, the um, um, sorry, the quotation that came out a few years ago, but it, it was said that the average person wears, buys something and they wear it on average of three times total before they never wear it again. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. And, you know, I do love the, the uh, excitement and, people that love to thrift and I like that uh, the communities that are uplifting you know uh, thrift shops or even in Milan uh, is it that the East Market yeah it's an experience in itself it's not just you know buying secondhand things but it's kind of a culture and I think a way you can you know if you buy a new jacket or new pants new from a store like hey maybe there's a thrift shop nearby or a market that's just part of what you do I'm gonna buy secondhand but I'm also gonna supplement that with some new um, Anyway, I just think it's buying habits, behaviors um, that we can all take a look at in a different way. Um, cool. Well, I mean, you've been ins insightful beyond my imagination. I can talk to you for hours and hours. And it's almost time for a beer. I don't know about you, but uh, maybe we can fit that in later. Um, but a couple of questions I wanted to talk about and in regards to maybe a little bit of just Italiano, uh, just some, some words and some phrases that that you've mentioned or I've heard that I, I really latch on to, I want to share with maybe some of English speaking or other cultures. And you mentioned the term due ascoltare campagne, basically li listening to two bells. Can you elaborate on really what the meaning is behind that? Yes, I mean, it goes beyond merchandising, but uh, it can be applied to merchandising too. So it's uh, in a way, 
to live and work and, uh, you know, have relationships that uh, go beyond uh, the bias, obviously. And we all have bias through education, uh, culture, and the uh, place we've uh, spent the most of our lives. So I think it's important uh, to kind of always keep that in mind, or at least it's something that I do keep in mind, that, uh, you know, we live um, in a world where information is uh, so plural that uh, only kind of... Uh, live in an echo chamber and listen only to what uh, uh, we expect uh, is probably um, a pity uh, in order to elevate ourselves. I think uh, ascoltare due campane, so listen to both bells, uh, uh, to both, both versions of things uh, is always a smart thing to do. Yeah, and, and I, I kind of take it as having an open mind, right? And I, I really like that. So I'm, I'm going to take that with me beyond. Um, so please share more of those with me as we're now friends. I appreciate that. Um, what I'd like to get into is a little bit about your consultancy, uh, Scythia. Um, first off, it's wh where to find you online, and that's Scythia.com, and that's S-A-I-T-H-I-A, -I -I correct? Correct, yeah. Can you give us a little peek inside and introduction into your consultancy? Absolutely. So we are a consulting agency <coughs> specialized in fashion merchandising tactics. Um, our goal is to um, help uh, fashion brands stay relevant through merchandising tactics that uh, improve collection efficiency. <clears throat> so this is what, what we sell, collection efficiency. Uh, we optimize product assortment. <clears throat> so um, let's say our core business is collection merchandising or product merchandising, so the upstream part of the merchandising, but uh, we also consult on the downstream part. Uh, but if we focus on collection merchandising, this is definitely <clears throat> our core business. And um, we work with uh, small to medium fashion companies that do not have merchandising in-house. And uh, we help them uh, to structure their assortment <coughs> with collection briefs uh, to define the strategy and the tactic to go to market with the best possible assortment in order to protect their creativity, but also to maximize business opportunities. Wow. What an amazing asset for any company of any size that doesn't have that function or they don't have that function to the capacity of where it could be. Um, and you shared with me some of the, the brands and the, the projects that you've worked on. Um, I'm excited to hear more. It sounds like you have a course that's coming up, right? Yes, absolutely. So the idea is really to kind of share this uh, knowledge that I accumulated over my corporate career in those uh, great brands with uh, the widest audience. And uh, a course in preparation coming up uh, really soon uh, is going to be divided in chapter covering all aspects of merchandising. So beyond uh, collection merchandising, touching on retail merchandising, planning and uh, everything that is uh, involved with it. So best practices, efficiency, knowledge um, of merchandising as a whole. And I would say from someone that's been in merchandising more or less for 20 years plus, I would love to, to, to get your perspective and, and learn something on that side as well. So um, I'm happy to share that beyond uh, my network. You are welcome. Great. And so um, when do you perceive this coming out? So it's going to be in six months' time. So I also have a podcast specialized, I mean, focused on uh, collection merchandising, where I'm going to interview uh, like uh, the most relevant uh, merchandiser in the industry. And that's also coming out uh, next year. So this podcast has been a great insight for me also to understand uh, the best way to do a, a proper podcast. I can't wait for that. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about the course. Um, I'll leave... All the details um, as they come at, are available on the show notes. Um, but how to find uh, Luigi um, is easy. And I, again, I'll put that on there. It's Scythia as his company, Scythia.com. Um, I wanted to leave for the final segment um, for you to ask me anything you'd like. Sort of a tradition on my show. The first thing that comes to mind is uh, since you move from California to uh, the Italian part of Switzerland, it goes beyond merchandising, but... Uh, how do you find this experience in Switzerland? Funny you say, this is the, the most popular question so far on the show. Um, and I'll try not to answer it the same exact way, but um, it really all comes down to making this an adventure and making it the most positive journey as possible. Um, you know, my family and I, you know, we moved during the middle of the pandemic. We moved in September 2019. We came here and didn't speak a, really a lick of Italian. I was here with my seven-year-old daughter and my amazing wife. 
Ashley, um, and we went for it. And I think there's no regrets because if we, if we were to stay where we were, we would have been in basically like captivity. You know, we, we would have been quarantined like everybody else, but we got to take advantage of learning a culture and being vulnerable. And I think uh, being vulnerable is where you learn the most, is where you pivot, changes happen, because you sort of have to. So for me, I sort of relied upon my creativity and my curiosity to kind of guide me. You know, I remember one of my first experiences here was just going to the grocery store. I didn't really know any Italian at all, and I was having to listen and try to understand through a mask or through a plexiglass. And so it really forced me to listen and learn and be respectful and appreciate at a whole new level. So having that heightened sense of um, appreciation really opened doors for me uh, personally and professionally. Um, you know, I'm not fluent in, a, in Italiano yet, but I did pass a test that I'm proud of uh, to allow us to stay uh, uh, living in this country for a bit. Um, but really it comes down to the appreciation of the pe people and the cultures and the traditions that are still uh, alive and well here that are very different uh, than the U.S. I'm going to ask another question since uh, this one has been asked already, but thanks for the different answer. Please. It's a bit more personal because I know that... Uh, you share a uh, passion uh, about uh, fashion and merchandising also yeah. with your better half. And uh, I wanted to ask you uh, how much of an asset was uh, to have somebody that uh, knew uh, the job uh, really well that you were doing, H how much of an asset was to be able to talk with somebody that really knew the in and outs of your job at home? Uh, like throughout our relationship or through our time here in Switzerland? throughout the relationship? I mean, we don't know any different. I mean, we met in 2007 working at Vans. Uh, we were both buyers at the time before we became full product merchandisers and leading teams and product lines. Um, again, we didn't know any different. Um, but I think, you know, like in any great relationship, you start as friends. You start um, by laughing and enjoying each other. But the common bond is, is your profession, right? And regardless of the different categories, um, we, we were able to kind of share our perspectives and sort of cross-pollinate ideas and our approaches to, to merchandising. Um, and uh, mine might look very different than my wife. And, uh, but I just, I think having the asset of uh, leveraging each other's styles and perspectives when creating a presentation or um, thoughts on opportunities to, 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 to build a team um, I think has been a really great advantage because you're not always seeing it from the outside. And for someone that might work within the same company, they'll have perspective sort of from a different angle um, that you wanted to listen, listen to and appreciate. Um, but also it's nice to keep things as separate as possible. <laughs> um, but no, we both uh, love merchandising. Um, I love products and I love people. And that's uh, a big reason why um, I started my consultancy um, that I got the opportunity to, to work with people to help um, enhance their experience and elevate what it is they're doing or they want to do um, personally, but also professionally. And it was, it's been a great opportunity to also leverage that to, to do that for brands as well, is to help them with product merchandising. And it usually always leads into coaching. So I know I answered that above and beyond the question, but uh, I was just blowing. Thanks, man. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? Cool. We could speak for hours and hours. We could uh, speak for hours and hours. Well, I want to thank uh, Luigi uh, for coming here. I mean, I'm a fan of you, and I know we're friends, and I'm so grateful and thankful for Francesco. Um, he's the owner of this amazing studio and this wonderful restaurant uh, called Grotto Valletta um, in Lugano, Switzerland. Um, hopefully, I'll have some nice music in the background in this show because the studio is awesome, and I can't wait to have another interview here. And I wish Luigi... Uh, nothing but success with Scythia and your future endeavors. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. See you guys. Over and out. Ciao.